Ghost, great to see you all once again. What a meaningful day it is, Mother's Day, and very fitting with the portion of the Lord's Prayer that we'll focus on today. Um, I understand that Logos has a tradition of giving back in a very small, small way where the dads and husbands help prepare food for the mothers, and I think that's wonderful, a wonderful tradition. And I'm interested to know this, who would raise your hand and feel free to look around, who would say that it was your mother who was uh, one of the first people who let you taste the goodness of the Lord, your mother or grandmother, let's show of hands, wow, mothers and grandmothers were among the first to let you taste the goodness of the Lord, can we give our mothers and grandmothers a big round of applause? Um, Above all the other service, all the other um, gifts that mothers give, there's no better gift, is there, than to allow us to taste the bread of life and to taste from their own experience, their own love for Christ. Um, What a blessing that is. Let me read our passage for today. We've been focusing on the Lord's Prayer, uh, kind of slowing down this walk through the Gospel of, of Luke and Understanding the Lord's Prayer, it's Jesus himself, God made flesh, teaching us, his disciples, how to pray. There's no one better that we can learn from. And each week we focused on one portion of the Lord's Prayer, and my goal here today is is to continue that. Um, My prayer is that by the end of our time together in the Word this this afternoon, that you will have um, some good insights, so when you pray, Uh, Give us this day our daily bread that you'll have new insights and that God will open that up in your prayer life throughout the week. That's the first goal. And the second goal is that even in this hour that you will taste the bread of life and that you will fill yourself this this time as we worship together with Jesus. Those are my goals for today. So please turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 11. We also see the Lord's Prayer in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. We're continuing the book of Luke, which has been the pattern. It's been very helpful to me personally. It's been a joy. And so in Luke, chapter 11, let's read verses 1 through 4. I'll read it aloud, and I invite you to follow along. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord Teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Well, the focus for today is the bread of life. We pray to God, give us each day our daily bread. So the question I want to invite you to consider and reflect this morning is this. What is it that fuels your life? What is it that sustains you from day to day? Where do you find strength When you are most weak. Shortly after Christ was crucified and rose from the dead, the worst time of persecution for church history began. And two things were happening on on the world history, okay? The Roman Empire was the dominant empire at the time. It was declining. Weak leadership. They had expanded too far. They had overextended themselves as an empire. And they were not holding it together. So while the Roman Empire is declining, this budding new movement begins within the Roman Empire called Following Christ. And organized churches were meeting, and then the Roman Empire saw this as a threat. So during the time of decline, the Roman Empire persecuted the Christians. It wasn't until later when Constantine said, if you can't beat the Christians, join them. And he officially pronounced the Roman Empire from now on will be a Christian empire. And so that was the turning point. But during this time, we have the the rise of Christianity happening simultaneously 
with the decline of the Roman Empire. During this time of persecution, emperor after emperor were scrambling to find whatever it could they could to raise the momentum to build up the morale of the empire once again. The most notorious Roman Empire's name was Nero. It, it was Nero who persecuted the church, and um, under his rule, most likely were Peter, the father of the Christian church in Jerusalem, where he was killed. Well, during this time of, of decline of the Roman Empire, there was a severe famine in Rome itself. And uh, history records will recount that during this time of famine, people, especially the peasants, they were longing to have grains. There weren't enough crops to produce enough food to feed the people, and so they had to begin importing grains from other parts of the empire just to have their bread. So they would look across the ocean like this, and they would see these ships arriving at their docks and hoping that the ships would contain grain so they could finally have food again and feed the masses during this time of famine. Well, under the rule of Nero, Instead of bringing grain to feed the people, he would bring shipload after shipload of sand from the desert. And he was bringing the sand to fill the Colosseums for entertainment. They recreated naval battles. Um, they had the gladiatorial arenas were, were filled with sand because it would absorb the blood of the martyrs and of the gladiators. So can you imagine living in a time where you're in famine you're starving for food, and you see these ships arrive, all the resources it takes to bring a shipment of something heavy like that to find out instead of grain, you're getting sand. What a disappointment. What a poor use of the resources of the empire. Do you think it would be a stretch to say that right now our society is in a time of spiritual famine? The world is starving, but yet settles for entertainment over true substance. I think this is important for us to understand when we pray, give us this day our daily bread. I don't think we know what it's like to go hungry as much as many have known in centuries past. Um, we, we probably have relatives who have lived through the Great Depression, um, others who have lived in other parts of the world where the conditions are very different. Uh, my family was telling me about friends of theirs in the church who come from Venezuela. Venezuela has the natural resources to be the most wealthy country in South America. They're on the coast. They have, you know, lush vegetation, good soil, and oil. And yet they're ruled by an oppressive regime similar to Nero. And the people are starving. They can't go to church on Sunday because they have to wait in lines so long just to buy groceries. Well, even if we can't relate to physical hunger in the same way, I hope that our spiritual hunger will match that of our brothers and sisters in Venezuela and of the early church in this time in the Roman Empire. May we be that hungry for the true bread of life. And Jesus uses bread very often as a powerful symbol for his teaching. <coughs> Excuse me. His first miracle was performed at a wedding. So you have this wedding feast where he turns the water to wine. Um, he multiplied bread uh, two different times, feeding crowds of thousands and thousands of people. And one of the most meaningful teaching moments for his disciples that would become the, the fathers of the church was the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, the breaking of bread with one another. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. And the Lord's Prayer, especially in Luke chapter 11, it's, it's in truncated. It's a short version of the Lord's Prayer, likely one that they rehearsed and they said often. It's, it was something they knew by memory and by heart. So in Matthew chapter 6, we get a longer version of the Lord's Prayer. Matthew, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 11 is even shorter. So every line that makes it into the Lord's Prayer, especially the shorter version in Luke, is worth meditating on. And it's worth praying and understanding and unpacking. So let's learn to pray from Jesus. What all could he be teaching us when he says, give us this day our daily bread? Bread has always been essential, and in Jewish and Israelite culture, it actually represented food in general. So bread, similar to how we use the expression today, uh, being a breadwinner for the family, or um, 
working hard to put bread on the table, right? Even if, even if someone has a gluten allergy, you're still, quote unquote, putting bread on the table because you're feeding, you're providing that substance. So bread in the scripture is a metaphor for life and for sustenance. And let's understand today um, I believe that we can understand through a biblical theology, looking at all of Scripture, seven insights regarding the bread of life. When Jesus teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. So number one, bread, we're taught, represents provision. And it's very easy for us, all of us, I believe, to, to buy the lie and fall into the trap of believing I can be my own provider. It's understandable that we'd want to work that way. Um, Delayed gratification, you know, working hard, paying your dues, all of that is for a purpose. We're doing that for some reason. So those are all good things. Working hard is a good thing. Delayed gratification, saving, planning ahead, is, those are all good things. But we fall into the trap then of believing if I'm responsible enough, if I'm hardworking enough, if I'm dedicated enough, I can provide for myself and for my family. And that's the first thing we're taught in the Lord's Prayer. We're taught to ask God to be our provider. It's humbling to have to do that. It's humbling to have to say, Father, please give us what we don't have and what we can't get for ourselves. The best example of when God reminded his people, he's forming a nation around himself and his mission, and he reminds them, I will provide for you. And the best picture of this is the Israelites. After God delivered them out of slavery, they're wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. It's basically a lifetime in the wilderness. And God sends them bread from heaven. So this bread from heaven, they get it and they say, what is this? And that became the nickname. Manna means what is this? That's how how foreign of a concept that God would just provide bread, especially to these former slaves. They had been working tirelessly for their slave masters to earn the lab, you know, to labor and labor and build up the, the Egyptian nation and earn their, at least earn their food for their family. And God's teaching them, no matter how hard you try, no matter how much you work, I am your God and I will be your provider. You will not provide for yourself. When we accept God as our provider and we pray, Father, give us this day our daily bread, It's a protection against both the dangers of poverty and of uh, extravagant wealth. We're depending on God. So no no amount of wealth can make us self-sufficient. We always depend on God. And it also is a protection against the dangers of poverty. We are relying on God to provide. And the opportunities that um, we have, you know, from time to time to serve in a soup kitchen or to show acts of mercy, those are, that's God's way of providing in a sense, manna to others that are in need and protection against poverty. That's God's heart. It always has been. As he's providing manna, he's bringing in exiles from other nations. In fact, there are Egyptians who followed them out of Egypt as well, and God is their provider as well. Secondly, in Scripture we see bread. It's, it's a symbol as well of a relational bond. Bread is a, re, it's a symbol of a relational bond. The giving of bread to another is a major element of hospitality, and it was a a part of God's instructions for his new nation that he formed in the wilderness. When a visitor comes to your house, lay out the the food before them. You know, whatever you have, go, go kill the calf, make a meal, and exchange that bread. Show that kind of hospitality. We see this example in Genesis 14 and 18 and 19, also in Deuteronomy. And it's a very a beautiful picture of hospitality and, and uh, a social bond, relational bond, in the, gospel, in the book of Ruth, Ruth chapter 2. Um, now, taking it a step further, not only does bread symbolize a social bond among people, bread in God's new nation, it also symbolized communion with God. Every Sabbath, the priests were told to take bread and bring it into the presence of God every single week. Now, the pagan gods all around the Israelites, they they needed sacrifices for their own purposes. Um, It was believed that when you burnt the fire, it was literally feeding these pagan gods. In the case of the Israelites, this was very different. 
God was not teaching them that he is dependent on them and their gifts to him. He was simply saying, when we break bread together, when you bring bread into the presence of God, you're enjoying that hospitality and that fellowship with God himself. So it's a symbol of our opportunity to eat, have fellowship and communion and experience something intimate with our God. Number three in Scripture, this manna from heaven, um, it takes on a, a, a metaphorical meaning as well. So think of the parallels, okay? Moses led those that were in captivity, led them out of slavery they crossed the Red Sea, God part of the waters they crossed. They went into the wilderness on their way to a promised land. Jesus fulfills those same steps. Jesus calls uh, captives to follow him. And when he feeds the multitude, it had been right after he crossed the sea. You know, as you're reading through the gospel, you read this. They crossed the sea and then they went back and the multitude followed him. So when you first read it, you might think, well, he's just trying to get away from the crowd. Well, he's also following the, the example that God laid earlier, this pattern that Moses had laid. Call your disciples, call your people with you. He's crossing the sea, arriving on the other side, giving them the promise of a, a glorious promised land, a future heaven. And during this period, the multitude follows them away from all the villages. There's no food, and Jesus does a miracle, similar to the example of manna in the wilderness. Isn't that beautiful? So Christ is the greater Moses. He's fulfilling these same, um, same uh, purposes that God had in mind. And it doesn't stop with the life of Christ. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 17, we're told of this promise to the church. And the promise is this. The suffering that you're experiencing now will be sustained through hidden manna that God gives. So just as literal manna was given to the Israelites as they were in the wilderness, and Christ multiplied bread and fed the multitude, the church now, in the book of Revelation, even today, we are promised we still can feast on a hidden manna. And it refers, it refers to our faith in Christ himself. Christ will be our sustenance. Just like we need daily bread, we need to receive this freely from God, Christ is our sustenance now. Even better than that, Christ offers bread that gives eternal life. Um, here's an insight with the church in Pergamum. Pergamum. So the church in Pergamum is the church that receives this promise. You will be sustained through hidden manna. This church had one of their members executed. And even in the most peaceful of times, they were always in the danger, danger of being uh, complacent and then surrendering, just giving up. Why continue pursuing our faith? And people deny that the Lord, um, if they would deny the Lord under threat, then they would give up their salvation, but they would keep their life. So the promise of hidden manna, without God happening to open the skies again, there can be a quiet faith that sustains the church. As you go into school, in the workplace, right, in these hard relationships, conflict with neighbors, in those times, there's this hidden manna. And it's that inner strength, that peace, and that sustenance on Christ himself. Every morning it's new, and it's there for us. So the promise to this church in Pergamum it continues to us today. The hidden manna is ours to feast on. Number four, bread is a symbol of our pilgrimage toward holiness. In, in Hebrew culture, this was so entrenched. Remember, thousands and thousands of years of carrying on these rituals. It was so entrenched that they had a special feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it was to celebrate their exodus out of Egypt. Once again, if you let, if you let the bread rise, it's going to take a lot of time for the yeast to have its effect and spread through the whole dough to rise. But if you do it uh, unleavened bread, like flatbread or cracker, it's quickly, you know, you set the dough and you bake it and it's ready. So that was the food for the journey. It was the food of travelers. And once a year, God wanted his people to remember, you are travelers in this world. You are here for a purpose. It's a very important mission, but you're in passing. You're on a journey as pilgrims toward the holiness of God. 
the priests were to consecrate this bread before the Lord. And that was, again, that symbol of God's temple, the Holy of Holies, is the center of their entire community. All of their life was centered around the holiness of God. Do you remember this? And as, once a year on this pilgrimage back to the temple, they would be ascending toward the temple of God, marching toward holiness. To celebrate with the, the unleavened bread is a reminder, we're on this pilgrimage. We're moving toward the holiness of God. So unleavened bread represented departure from sin, departure from slavery. It represented, leaven uh, represented like the yeast represented sin. So we're leaving behind the old way of life. We're leaving behind our bondage to sin. And we're going to live lives that have no leaven or no yeast of sin. And Jesus warned them, even a little bit of yeast can work its way through the whole dough. So as a body of Christ, this is such an important exhortation. Remember, the bread is a symbol of our march together as a body toward holiness. Sin will only have a destructive effect. It will, it will hinder us from achieving our purpose and our mission as a body. Well, number five, and this is exciting because I love the, the name of the church, Logos. Um, and we're moving closer and closer to Christ. All, right? all of this is a backdrop for Christ himself to fulfill and ultimately consummate all that is meant by the bread of life. So number five, we're reminded that bread is God's word itself. Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. And this, Remember, this is Old Testament, but it's associating bread to the word of God already, way back in the Old Testament, um, the time of Moses. Here's what the verse says. He humbled you, and he let you hunger, and he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Amen. Job, Job chapter 23, verse 12, says a similar message. Job testifies, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. So Jesus, looking at the disciples that he loves, they're following him, and they ask him, teach us to pray. And Jesus quotes Job and he also had quoted Deuteronomy to Satan when he was tempted in the desert. You remember that? No, man does not live by bread alone, but from every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. The concept that bread is the word of God is such good news to us. It's such good news. And when we fast, when we, when we willfully set aside physical food, even for one meal, and we use that time to reflect on the Word of God as being better than bread. What a gift we receive. We feast on the Lord Himself. Just as our bodies cry out for food when they're hungry, may that be a reminder that our souls must cry out for the Word of God as our true source of nourishment and sustenance. Number six. This is the gospel, brothers and sisters. Jesus is our bread of life. In the gospel of John, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that you may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Christ gave his body on the cross. He rose to hold the keys to life and death. When he promises eternal life, he has the power to back that up. 
Just as God sent manna from heaven, God sent His only Son from heaven, from glory with Him, to be the bread of life for His people. What great news. Jesus is our bread of life. All that Jesus provides nourishes all of our needs. Jesus fills the emptiness and satisfies all of the deepest human longings. Those who belong to God's new nation must receive the gift of eternal life from God Himself, acknowledging that Jesus is God. He is the manna come down for us to feast on Him. I read recently that this, uh, this decade, you know, these generations right now with um, those of us right now who have families who are in the workplace, uh, there are a lot of, a lot of data. All, this, all the different industries want to know data about this generation. You know, what are we consuming? What are we interested in? What books are popular? And I read that this, despite, you know, in so many ways, it's, uh, health has never been better and economic stability is, um, you know, compared to other centuries of, of a, this country or other parts of the world, it's never been more stable. Despite all of that, this is one of the most anxious generations. And some have said it's pathological anxiety. Um, And there's a number of theories. What are the sources? Like what's causing the anxiety that our society experiences in general? And I think that, you know, Christ said, if you were to follow me, you must be like one of these children. So, I think that that's a really good answer to some of these questions. What is it that causes anxiety in children? And how can we then humble ourselves like a child and allow Christ to be our comfort? Um, here's, the, here's the illustration that was very meaningful to me. Pastor R.C. Sproul, uh, Ligonier Ministries out of Florida, was talking about uh, a, a person in his church who had gone um, to South Korea um, after the Korean War, after you know World War II, every, the dust was settling. Uh, but after the war, there had been so many soldiers that, that were killed um, that there were a lot of children in the streets. So churches heard about this and they said, let's move in, let's bring Christian schools and orphanages and let's take care of these children whose parents have been killed by the war. In these orphanages, uh, children were, were now receiving good care and love, and they were cared for by people like you, believers who know the Lord and know Jesus, but their physical needs had not been met for so long that they had extreme anxiety, these orphans, um, and no matter, no matter how long they had been there, they couldn't figure out a way to break this overall feeling of anxiety and depression, and they would talk to the children and say, what is it that you're really concerned about? And the, the thing they said is, after living on the streets for so many days and weeks, we're afraid that we're going to wake up tomorrow and it's going to be like that again, that we won't have food anymore. He said, but we've fed you every day, haven't we? Yes. And you've been with us for months now. You don't think that there will be bread and food for you tomorrow morning? And they said, we, we believe that because we, we love you guys and we trust you, but we've, just, we've been so hurt by what we experienced that we can't, make, we can't forget that. And that was the source of their anxiety. So the works at this orphanage, according to uh, the missionary who came back to tell R.C. Sproul, what they did was very simple. They would go to the bakery the night before and buy one small loaf of bread for every orphan. And that became a tradition at this orphanage that every, every single day before nighttime, every child would receive a loaf of bread not to eat, but to hold on to it. And that helped the anxiety to settle. So they would, you know, hold on to this instead of a stuffed animal or a blanket that would provide them a a sense of security, they would hold on to a small loaf of bread to know that their daily bread would be there for them the next morning. So back to our society and our generation. Why this pathological anxiety? Maybe we need to be like these children. And we need to go to sleep every night, wake up every morning, holding on to the bread of life. Amen. Which brings us to number seven. There are amazing 
blessings when we feast on the bread of life. As God supplies bread like manna and even the rain and the crops, and it's such a miracle that a seed would grow into food. That's God's working, and that's God's gracious reminder. Just as God provides us bread, we are promised in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10, that God will provide righteousness for his people in the same way. The verse says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Righteousness means being right with God. God's favor and approval is not something we can earn. It is something God must give. Give us this day our righteousness, God. Make us right with you. Just as you gave manna from heaven, give us your righteousness. After the resurrection, Jesus' eating of bread with his disciples was a celebration of his victory over death. We see this story in Luke chapter 24 and John 21. The Christians, after that, began to meet on the first of the week for the breaking of bread. It's a celebration that we can feast on the bread of life. Every week with God's word in his presence and communion, and every week corporately as a body of Christ. We can enjoy communion with God daily, the breaking of God, the experience of right standing with him through Christ. That is the promise we can cling to. Here's the second blessing when we feast on the bread of life. Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13. Paul adds his testimony to that of the prophets and the apostles. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And that was the question we started with today. What strengthens you? What fuels your life? And what is it that sustains you? When Christ is the source of our strength, like Paul testified for him, he had become that our provision, He is our sustenance, then we lack nothing, brothers and sisters. We learn to be content in any circumstance. He teaches us to rely upon Him to take hold of His strong hand, and then we can face whatever we must with Him as our mighty shield. Picture uh, picture, uh, standing at the bottom of a small waterfall. I can't see the water supply behind where the water drops off. I can't see the the creek or the lake that's pushing all that water. But I know that if I come to this waterfall, there will be water for me right here. That's all that I can see. It's from this point to right here, and there's enough water. And I can have that fear like the orphans that it might dry up, and I'll wake up tomorrow, and there will be no water dripping down for me to drink. But this is the testimony that we can hold on to. If the source of the water is Christ himself, remember the image last week about the the mountain, the temple, the, the river that flows from that? That is the same picture of the Garden of Eden is the same picture we have of the end times. You know, Christ someday will bring his kingdom back. He is the source of light for the new earth. He is the river, the source of the river that flows and feeds the crops. And makes the food abound. So we don't have to believe on this source being anything other than Christ himself. And we saying that he is Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. If we truly believe that, Christ is our endless supply of food and water and nourishment and sun and light. We will lack nothing. And he will be our mighty shield. And there are extremely hard things Everybody goes through and individuals go through. And I think it's, it's very uh, reassuring that Christ doesn't 
doesn't stretch our faith beyond, faith beyond one day, but give us this day our daily bread. Be our sustenance for today. Because tomorrow we'll have enough troubles of its own. I can wake up, but I know it's the same Christ. He's not going anywhere. He is the bread of life I'm going to hold on to as I sleep and wake up by faith that he'll be there again for me the next morning. So in closing, one last blessing, a result of feasting on Jesus as our bread of life. Ephesians 3, verse 16, and also chapter 6, verse 10. According to the riches of his glory, Christ grants you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. When we fill ourselves with Jesus daily, we enjoy an endless spiritual feast. We are nourished and delighted by the riches of his glory. We commune with God on a daily pilgrimage, pursuing Him as our holy center. The very Spirit of God fills, pushes out everything else, and He fills our inner being. His power becomes our strength. Amen. Amen. that God gave John in the book of Revelation, the marriage supper of the Lamb. John records this. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. And the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Amen.